Praise God. I'd like to get your attention focused in on 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.15. And the word of the Lord says the following. The word of the Lord says the following. 2 Timothy 2.15. Study. What does it say? Study. Study. Most of you know that there's only one verse in the Bible that begins with the word study. Well, there are very few. There's one famous one. Study. Here's the second word, to. Can you guess what the word third word is? Study to. Show thyself approved unto your pastor. Study to show thyself approved unto your boss, unto your HOA president. Study to show thyself approved unto no one but God. He's the one who will do the final approving. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Brother Kevin Workman, this is his favorite verse in the entire Bible. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. This is verse 16 says, but shun, get rid of, push away from you, resist profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. All right? Study to show thyself approved unto God. So we're going to do that tonight. We're going to be. We're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to study to show ourselves. The Bible says to study, so we're going to study. You, you, it's okay if you shake your head because the Bible doesn't tell us in that context. That's what. That's not what we're here to do. It, it doesn't say for us to get together and study the Word of the Lord because that's not the right wording. All right. I want to help us with that tonight. Because I want us to truly do exactly what it says, but that's 1611 language. In 1611, study did not mean bury your head in a book and read and focus and go over the material and try to get it understood and come up with a conclusion. That's not what study meant in 1611. In 1611, study meant something else. And I have the 1611 dictionary open right now to help you know what it means. All right? That's, folks, I've been scratching my head all day. Like, how in the world did study become study when it started out being the, another kind of study? So we'll all study on that for a little while. All right? Praise God. And one more scripture I'd like for everybody to take a quick look at with me. And that is Psalm 138, verse number 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Something about the Word is of ultimate importance to God. And I want to be a workman who can rightly divide the Word of truth. And how many of you would like to do that too? Rightly divide the Word of truth. Amen? Praise God. Now, would you just put your Bibles down and let's together, let's just approach the Lord and ask for Him to speak words of sensibility words that cut straight to the issue and help us to get out of here with a better understanding of what the word is really after in these scriptures lord jesus we thank you for the preeminence thank you lord for the for the austerity lord and the priority of your word praise you god for the priority of your word in our hearts lord let your word have priority in our hearts if it's a priority to you god Surely we can make it a priority for ourselves. In Jesus' name. Everybody who's glad to be here, say amen. Are you really glad to be here tonight? 
Let's get into the Word tonight for a little while. You all are welcome to take your seats. I have brought with me the book that we are, this is the textbook that we're using in high school, Calvary Academy High School and some others who are joining us outside of high school. It's written by an apostolic author by the name of Timothy M. Harris, apostolic, Pentecostal, Holy Ghost-filled pastor, and his ministry is JustWordMinistries.com. You can buy copies of this book for yourself at JustWordMinistries.com. This is called Born of Water Textbook, and the students are going through this very carefully, thanks to Sister uh, Stacy Mitchell, Sister Carla White, and then I come in once a week and uh, touch base with them on the material. But listen, I, we were going over this last week, and it's just too good to keep it to ourselves. This is so amazing. In the preface, it says, because biblical numbers are significant and have been acclaimed as the highest level of of studying the scripture, I've incorporated the same to further explore the truth on water baptism and Jesus' name. Numbers. Numbers. He says numbers. Numbers are significant in highest level of study. He says there, and if you're interested in the highest level of study, you're going to have to get this book and figure out what he means by highest level of study. But it is a very excellent book on baptism in Jesus' name. And he says, I've incorporated the same numbers and the numbering system to further explore the truth. Here's the reason. Check this out. Here's the reason why the first two statements from Hebrew, from the Hebrew of your Bible, text equal 999, comma, 999. In the beginning was the word. Nope. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. Those two statements equal 999999. Now, the same reason why the last word in the Greek text equals 99. Nine. 9 is the last word, amen. And the reason why is because the number 9 is final. With the number nine, you don't mess with it. You, you, you lower the gavel. You close the books. You cancel all debts, and you say it's all done, said and done, and we're not going to change any of it. It can't be changed. It's all settled, and it's all completely perfect as written. Nine. And then he says there's a reason Jesus' Greek name is Eshuas, which equals 888, because if nine means final, eight means new. And there's a reason for all the sevens around the crucifixion of Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrew equals 770. The Hebrew phrase, make his soul an offering for sin, equals 777. And Christ equals, the word Christ equals 77. The site of the crucifixion is 777 meters high. The Greek word for cross, staros, equals 777. And the rock that supposedly held the cross is 21 square meters, which is 7 plus 7 plus 7. For the word 7 means finished. Isn't that amazing? The statement Jesus made on the cross numerically confirmed it is finished. So throughout this book, this textbook, numbers are incorporated to help students understand that it's not just about the text, but it's about the miraculous occurrence of the, of, the, of the numerical system throughout the Bible that's used in the Hebrew and the Greek text. Folks, our, your, our students are going to get pretty excited. I think they're going to be pretty well-versed when it comes to understanding how everyone needs to be born of water, and you cannot argue with God's word. How many of you already knew that stuff about the numbers? Brother Ben Mitchell, because he was in the class last week. But isn't that great, folks? That's, the, that's the, what we're standing on. How many of you are standing on the promises of Christ our Savior? Are any of you standing on the rock? Any of you, have we been going over the series enough that we have words of Jesus Christ that are our rock? We have a rock, and that is our 
Bible. Thank God for the Bible, which is our eternal guidebook for how to be saved and how to stay saved and how to get saved in the first place. Thank God for the Word. How many of you brought your Bible? Tuesday night's a really good time to bring your Bible. Next Tuesday night, 5 o'clock, we'll begin a live stream on that big stream, that big screen up there. Next week, 5 o'clock p.m. Most of you will probably not be able to make it. I understand. But at 6 o'clock, that's when the meat of the service begins that will be streaming in Indianapolis. It's the general conference of the UPCI. You do not want to miss that service. It's a special service on home missions. 5 o'clock, you'll, be, you'll get a little extra bonus by being here if you come at 5 next week because you'll get in on the worship. At, at, uh, in Indianapolis at the, at the uh, center where the, where the conference takes place. At 6 o'clock, I'm expecting about that time for Brother Huntley to begin preaching. I don't know for sure exactly what time, but it'll probably be, be around 6, which would be 8 there, 6 p.m. here. Do your best. Make a note. 6 p.m. Be right here in the sanctuary. And then 6 o'clock, 6.30, 6, 7 o'clock, probably pretty close to wrap-up time. And for those of you who've been here since 5 o'clock, you'll kind of be a little tired. But here's what I'm hoping to do is that next week, after it's over with, we're going to have a prayer meeting, and we're going to pray about what we've heard. The scripture that Brother Huntley's going to be using and his theme is going to be absolutely non-negotiable and very, very stirring for every one of us. Our greatest prisons have become a part of our lives, and they're none other than our sanctuary. The prison of the gospel has become our sanctuaries. That's what he's, he's laying down the law, that it's time for us to get into the field. The treasure is in the field is the title of his message. I'm so excited to tell you that we've got nearly 30 small groups that we're going to be hosting in the next 8 to 10 weeks at Calvary. Folks, you're gonna, when you see the menu, it's going to blow you away. You're going to be like, wow, how can I stop at just one of these? I want to go to all of them. You're going to have so much fun and so much uh, fellowship and lots of prayer and a lot of good food that's going to be happening across the city at our small groups throughout the month of uh, October, November, and right before Christmas, we will conclude the next semester. I'm so excited. Thank you all for, for, for making contributions, for turning in your, your, uh, your applications, your forms, to let us know your interest and your willingness to host a small group. Now, everybody else gets to sit back and wait for that great menu to show up, and we're having, a, uh, we're having an evening, actually we're having an afternoon on the 6th of October. We're going to go and have booths that you're going to see all the groups. You can sign up and, and, uh, and make your, make your n- presence known for any of the groups you want to attend, because some of them have, uh, most of them will have a cap. We can't all go because there's a certain uh, limitation of space. So anyway, we got to get the word out of these four walls. we got to start testifying in our neighborhood, start testifying to people we've never met before, start looking at the population around us as not as, not as rivals and not as people who we got to get ahead of, because that's the way it feels like when you're in traffic, doesn't it? Amen. But we got to look at them as souls who need the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. All right, we got a kind of a quiet crowd here tonight. Too bad I don't have a... I don't have a hat with uh, rabbits to pull out of tonight. But uh, if y'all will just focus in here tonight, I want us to talk about this one scripture. Let's lock in to 2 Timothy 2.15 for a minute. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved. In other translations, for instance, the English Standard Version, it clears it up. It doesn't mean study like you're going to class. Or study like you're going to take a test, or study because you got to make a give a speech. It is study means to strive or to aim. In the English Standard, it says, "Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed." Rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. And he gives examples of a couple of New Testament figures who were people just like that, who were 
irreverent babblers, and they led people away from the truth. And everybody knew who they were talking about when you read, if you were, especially if you were, if you were Timothy and Timothy's surroundings and his cohorts, you knew these guys were vain babblers and they were leading others to ungodliness, which basically means they were leading them away from the truth of the Word of God. They were not rightly handling. The, the King James says rightly dividing the word of truth. It really means rightly handling the word of truth. Your Bible is not intended to be something that is casually or flippantly approached at, at, a, at a point in life when you're desperate for a need or when you just are looking for something to read. It's not, a, not an emergency escape. It's not something that's entertainment. Folks, our Bible is something that we're going to have to read in order to be approved by God. And we've got to, here's what we've got to do. We've got to do our best. I'd like to lead a congregation that has got it in their hearts that we want to strive. We want to aim toward being the very best we can be and we can be approved as a word worker who does not need to be ashamed of the of a, because of the way we're handling the word of truth. What does this tell you? This tells you that handling the Bible takes work. It doesn't just happen by osmosis. You don't just plug in your headphones and into your phone or listen on, on a headphone to your, to, your, to your phone playing the Bible and you just get to casually listen in. Now, some people do that and I've done that. And it's a good way to, to hear the word on a passive basis. But folks, if you are only going through life with passive understanding of the word of God, you will have a passive You'll have a passive life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what you're going to risk is a God looking to you passively and saying, well, if you were passive with me, I'm going to be passive with you. And you really didn't give me a whole lot of time or attention. I'm not going to give you a lot of time or attention. What we've got to do is we've got to say, God, I want to be someone who really understands the word study. Can I get study into your head tonight? Let's walk out of here as though we were in 1611. What would we all look like if we all walked in here in 1611 clothing? It would be like the Renaissance Festival, wouldn't it? Can you imagine all of us in our robes and our hoods? And some of us probably have some swords and sandals. And yeah, we'd all have our wild animals, our, 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 our beasts of burden outside waiting for us. 1611. But if you were in 1611, here's what you knew the word study means. So let's make sure we have 2 Timothy 2.15, King James on the screen, please. I want us to really catch this. If we're obedient to Acts 2.38, we need to be Acts two, uh, obedient to 2 Timothy 2.15, okay? If we're obedient and thankful for the fact that God so loved the world and that Jesus Christ is coming to catch his bride away and that we are, must be born again of the water and of the spirit, which those things are apostolic, I want to tell you something. It's easy for us to fall short when it comes to 2 Timothy 2.15, and I do not want that to happen. I want to be a part of a family that understands what it means to study, to show myself approved. And here, here's the words that you get out of your 1611 dictionary, to strive toward, to direct one's efforts to, to set one's mind on, or to devote yourself to something. That is exactly what the writer is telling the reader in this passage. We all need to just, we need to, we need to be people who are, who are focused in. We have, a, we have a locked in mindset on the things of God, and the Word of God is something to be, and, and being approved by God is something that we've got to say, Lord, this has got to be a lifestyle. This has got to be every day. I've got a desire today more than anything else. I've got to set my mind on presenting myself to God as one approved. I've got to, I've got to focus in and devote my days and my my, my, my passive thoughts and just my passing thoughts. Every, every thought, whether it's a just a passing fancy or whether it's a deep thought of concentration and meditation, I want to set my mind on God and his word. A worker that has no need to be ashamed. We will end up ashamed and making God ashamed of us if we do not rightly handle the word of truth. So here's what I'd like to do tonight. I'd like to make sure that as God's people, that we all are workmen. Can I invite you to the forge? Can I invite you to the smelting fire? Can I invite you to the work shed where we're going to Get busy. We're going to put our gloves on, roll up our sleeves. We want to be workmen. We want to say the word of God is not something that happens by play. It doesn't happen by casual thought. And it doesn't happen by just routine. But it is something that happens by 
purposeful, hard work. A workman is someone who is basically a man who works. A workman is someone who works. So, word encounters by God's servants. I want us to be careful how we hear the word of the Lord. I want us to be careful how we hear. And, and the, the Bible tells us very clearly in, in, a, in a Luke 8, verse number 9. This will help maybe to firm this up a little. Jesus' disciples asked Jesus about the parable of the sower. And they said, what might this parable be? And he said in Luke 8, 9, verse number 10, unto you it's given into the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables that they might not see. And hearing they might not understand. And Jesus says in Luke 8, 11, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The seed, everybody say the seed is the word of God. The word of God is the seed. And then if you skip down through the, through the, the, par- the parable there, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I'm not going to go through the parable because most of us are aware there are three types of soil that finally, finally lead up to the fourth type of soil. That's the good soil. The bad soil, there's three of them, and the good soil, there's only one. There, there are three soils that are, that, are, that are what is considered to be incapable of truly gathering fruit from. There's no harvest. There's no profit. They will not produce. Those types of soil will not produce. The word of the Lord falls upon those types of soil, but nothing happens. Nothing comes from it. Basically, the soil is, is, is what you would consider to be barren. No birth given. No fruit grows from it. No green stems come up to grow to mighty, strong, fruit-bearing trees. And it all starts with the seed falling into the soil. But in verse number 18, it is super clear. Would you read with me? It's right there on your screen. Let's read it together. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. That is the solution to the entire parable of the soils. Take heed how you hear. Some people hear the word and they have hardened, packed soil and they do not let there be any penetration. There are some who have the soil that is stony and they have shallow reception of the word of God and that gets them nowhere. And some have crowded lives by thorns and weeds and and the seed gets nowhere there uh, either. So the fourth type of soil is the good soil, and the whole thing that sets the good soil apart, listen to this, it eagerly and deeply absorbs the word of God. What, 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 hold on, what, word, word, word of God, what do you mean word of God? Well, the seed is the word. The good soil, it kind of like soaks it in and says, come on in and become a part, because as soil, I exist for you, seed. I don't exist to be just dirt. I exist to be fruitful in my dirtness. I don't want to be a dirt person made out of clay. Humans are basically glorified mud balls. I don't want to be just a dirt ball that's not an absorbing and eager and ready individual to deeply absorb the word of God and say this word is going to come and it's going to stay. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119.11. That makes even more sense in this context. If we will hide the word of the Lord in our heart, we will not be sinners by being barren and fruitless and being worthy only to be burned. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Everybody say, eat them. Yeah, thy words were found, and I gobbled them up like a happy meal, warm and fresh out of McDonald's kitchen. I ate thy words. They were found, 
and I, I was sitting in church on Tuesday night. I was leaning into it. I wasn't just casually chilling out and saying, well, I'm supposed to be here. Otherwise, the pastor's going to call me, and I don't want to bother him, so I'm just going to come and hang out. You know, I, I got family. If they don't see me in church, they're going to wonder where I'm at, what's going on. No, 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 no. We've got to be, we've got to transform our heartbeat, folks. If, and I, don't, I know there's not very many that way, but if we would happen to have that kind of a tendency to be in a Bible study or even when it comes to opening our Bible to read our Bible, if we do it out of routine and we do it because we're just supposed to or because we have it as a to-do item, we have to, to, our to-do is to read the Bible. Can I tell you, if you approach it in any other manner besides a hungry individual, I want to come to church hungry, and I'd like for you to join me. Let's all come to the house of God hungry. When we have a small group that's studying the Word of God, come hungry. When you have a Bible study gathering in the neighborhood, go hungry for the Word of the Lord. I have a feeling you most of you wouldn't even be here tonight if you were not hungry for the Word of the Lord. Don't you love Jeremiah? He says, Thy Word words were found and I did eat them and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart for I'm called by my by thy name O Lord of hosts Lord God of hosts and he goes on to say this Jeremiah 20 verse number 9 he says his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. I had to let it out. I had to speak it out. I had to testify. I had to tell somebody. I had to sing a song. Amen. I had to quote a scripture. There was something burning down in, inside of me. I love it. Burning fire shut up in my bones. Those are powerful words right there. And they speak so clearly that imagine if you had fire shut up in your bones. Wouldn't you be someone who was who, who was kind of antsy? Kind of feeling a little a little unsettled and couldn't sleep. How many of you could sleep with fire inside your pajamas? Fire. If you could sleep with, none of us could do that. What if the Lord is stirring up a church in these last days? Calvary, what if the Lord is stirring us up to say, if you'll just really get serious about my word like you never have before. I know there have been times we've had deep, deep conversations of the word, but it's time for us to take personal I'm, here's what I'm here to say tonight. It's time for us to take personal responsibility for our ownership of the Word of God. And the Word of God has never been more available than it is right now. And it's a worse time in history for us not to make it clear that you and I can go through a day and have a lot of Word packed into us if we just pay attention. A lot of Word. And a lot of it happens from listening to good music. Amen. Amen. And listening to the right programming and hearing the things of the Lord off of, when you're, when you're, when you're in housekeeping or when you're doing routine chores, get the word of the Lord. You know, I, I would love it if the, every day we would start waking up and saying, God, I'm hungry for something more than just my Cheerios. I'm hungry for more than just my, my Wheaties. Lord, I'm hungry for the word of the Lord. I'm hungry. Once again, let me remind you, this is an apostolic premier study Bible right here that's available from insigniabooks.com. It will really help stir you up if you start reading out of this, this the, the passages that are, that are written by apostolic Pentecostal authors. Folks, do whatever it takes to stay in the word. Get hungry for the word. Just a little sidebar, I want in 2020 to be a year for Calvary, to be across the board, everybody reading the Bible together, reading the Bible in step with each other, and coming to church to rejoice over what we've heard, what we've read, and what we've gleaned from the word of the Lord, ready to testify about it in our small groups. Can you say amen? Praise God. All right. He, there's another scripture that says, uh, uh, says the following here. It says in Romans 10, 8, the word is nigh unto thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That's where it's got to be. The word of God has got to be in our heart. So the word, everybody say the word. Seed is the word. We're going to have encounters with the word of God. And these encounters with God's word, whether it's the medium of music or whether it's a medium of somebody that's apostolic, that's, that you can trust is preaching the truth online, on YouTube, on Calvary's website, or you're listening in church right now, like you are right now when you come to church, whatever the medium, medium may be, even if you're, if you're reading a good book with Bible truths in it or you're reading the Bible itself, those are different media. And so here's what we got to say is, Lord, help me to make sure that when I am encountering, everybody say encountering, 
This right now, tonight, should be an encounter with God's word. This is not an encounter with Pastor Haman. This is an encounter with God's word. Did we all come for the same reason, or should we break out the coffee? Y'all okay? Encounter the word? Let's let it hit, up, hit us upside the head, all right? I, I want to make sure that when we get into areas, places, media, where the word of the Lord is shared and comes through it, we need to be ready to, to say in our hearts, the word is designed for spiritual growth and spiritual fruitfulness, not evaluation. I'm not just going to evaluate. I want to let it do its work inside of me. Now, I've got a short list of practical thoughts that I think are going to really help you, so you might want to get a pen and paper out. I'm not sure if they're on the screen or not, but so just let's plan on them not being there. I would highly recommend you get ready to write five things down when it comes to inter encountering the word of the Lord. But when, it, when the word of the Lord is preached either over the pulpit or it's preached through a song or it's preached through your own reading and devotion, I have these quick hazardous to your health statements that you need to catch. Please don't do these things. Number one, don't allow your spirit to become critical, thereby lowering the possibility of blocking receptivity. I don't want the Lord's word to be blocked. Number two, don't compare your pastor to the dozens of other communicators you can hear online. That's very dangerous. You can start comparing and say, well, he doesn't speak that good. He doesn't tell that fun those funniest stories, and he doesn't rap when he's talking, you know. And so I, I don't know, man. I found, found myself a great pastor. I'm, I, folks, we need, to, we need to understand that that the devil is here, and you know what he wants to do? He wants to snatch the word from your heart. Don't think about all, this is the last one, don't think about all the other people who need to hear the sermon until it's changed you first. <laughs> yeah, now we need to back up and talk about that, right? Because it's really easy to sit here and think, boy, oh boy, I'm so glad brother, oh, brother so-and-so is sitting over there. This is exactly what he needed to hear. Or sister so-and-so. Or, or, or sometimes we even sit in church, Brother Wes, and we're like, man, I can hardly get anything out of this because the one who needed to hear it's not even here. We've got to make sure we're not thinking about all the other people until we've let it change us first, right? And I'm talking about all, ca all encounters of the word of the Lord. So here we go. Here we go. I, I believe if you want to get something out of the Bible and you want to get something out of worship and get something out of study, you can. Everybody say, I can. You just got to be ready to catch these simple statements. Number one, focus on the messenger is a mistake. You must focus on the message. It's so important. We have several of you who, and we have students coming to Calvary from, from other churches and other parts of the state and the city, uh, the, the country now, because of college. And I, their parents are telling them, you got to listen to the message and don't worry about the messenger. He may not sound like, that's so wise for parents to do that. He may not sound like your pastor at home. He may not do it exactly like your pastor at home. Don't focus on the messenger. It's important to focus on the message first. So that's your first statement. Focus on the message, not the messenger. What in the world scripture would help us to understand that? Well, that really is the bottom line of what Jesus is saying in Luke 13, 34. Jesus looked at Jerusalem, and he called them out. Twice he called their name. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. The messengers keep getting killed. The messengers keep getting picked apart. The messengers keep having to go to an early grave. The messengers, the, the, you're not listening to my word. You're just getting the message. The messenger is tripping you up and making you think that's what it's about. But it's not about the messenger. It's the message. He says how often, if you would only listen to the message, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. But you didn't want that to happen. If you would listen to the message and not get, a, get all strung out on the messenger. So what we need to ask ourselves is what's the main point of this sermon? What's the, let, me, let me just back up here for a second, all right? Because I, I am going to talk a lot here, and I'm, I'm, wrap, I'm about halfway through right now. But I want you all to know this has a lot to do, number one, with a pastor who has guts enough to talk about the best way to listen to preaching. 
Sometimes pastors don't want to talk about that because we just hope and pray people are getting it. But you know what I feel like doing tonight? I felt like this would be a good Tuesday night for us just to back up and make sure we're all on the same page as to why we're even here for preaching and teaching. And if we're getting the word of the Lord penetrating our hearts, that's what's got to happen. I mean, is there any more important point? No. But if the word is just, if it's just surface level, and no one is letting it penetrate, and they're just coming and nodding ahead or nodding off, then you know, probably, we might as well just have stayed home. So why don't we get into this and understand that when you come to church, when I come to church, when I listen to a, to a, a powerful song that is, that is bringing the word of God into my spirit, I've got to understand there's a main point to these, to these media. What is God saying to me? Tonight, I think it's important for us as a congregation just to stop once in a while instead of just having an all-out flat-footed sermon, and let's talk a little bit about how we how we hear. Take heed how you hear. If you hear wrong, the message is completely hijacked. If you hear right, then you don't have to have a special messenger. Isn't that cool? I mean, wouldn't it be great to have an amazing elocution and orator every single time we get together that just thrills us to death? I mean, you'd rather just go hear him than to watch a magic show. It's so fun. No, 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 that, that's got nothing to do with it, does it? And that, that, those, are, those are levels that are of entertainment we're not even talking about. We need to focus on the message, not the messenger. Number two, listen for insight. When you're in church, when you're gathering the word, listen for insight more than entertainment. Listen for insight more than entertainment. Because uh, it really would be nice to be entertained. And, you know, that's probably something that, that Christian artists, when it comes to good musicians and guys that are writing music and preachers and pastors who are talking to a crowd, we're up against a culture of entertainment. We're up against it. Because, I mean, you can sit down and for 90 minutes you're wowed by a big 4K, 6K, 8K screen that's blowing your mind with a surround sound and stuff's happening. and It's just like, whoa. Then we go to church and we just sit on the pew. Okay, I'm confronting that spirit right now. I'm confronting that right now and saying the spirit of the age would really love to empty out our, our hearts, but it starts by emptying out our churches and making it so church just isn't a place of importance. But can I tell you, if you come to church for the right reason and you say, Lord, I am coming because I want an encounter with your word and I want to know you better than I knew you before I went into the church service. I want to know you better than I heard the song that was written for my edification. Amen. I don't want to come in here looking for someone to just have to stir me up and make me laugh and make me all excited. And I, I leave thinking, wow, that was fun. No, 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 no. Right? Listen for insight more than entertainment. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm? Hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. I love it when we have team efforts leaning into our gatherings. The Apostle Paul is telling the, the ones who are leading church services, whatever you do, let all things be done unto edifying. You know what edifying means? If it hurts, if it's even boring to your flesh, let your spirit wake up. And say, this is not for my flesh. This is for my soul. My soul is starving, coming out of a world of no, no nutrition for the soul. But I'm finally at a smorgasbord buffet. Oh, it doesn't, may not feel like it to the flesh, but you know what? I'm coming in here, and I'm ready for insight. Pastor, I'm ready for insight. I'm ready for the wisdom of the word of the Lord to help me and to edify me so that on my decision-making time tomorrow, then I'm able to say what I'm going to say and do what I'm going to do from a higher platform of preparation than before. So, of course, enjoy the humor. Enjoy engaging stories. But keep listening. Listen for the insight that the Holy Ghost has for you. Look for it. Look for what's new for you in that moment of time. Praise God. A biblical or spiritual insight can be a new or a refresher, but either way, 
Look for those aha moments that something just hits you in the gut and makes you say, aha, now I know, and now I understand, and I remember. I am not here for entertainment. I'm here for insight. Praise God. All right, another little sidebar. This time it's going to be a sidebar over here. All right, here's my sidebar. I want to get, get, to get a very important point across. Why, why would I be talking about how you hear? That's what tonight's all about, how you hear. The workman, being, being the workman. There is a great analogy that is written in the book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That the, the story is told of saw cutters who work all day sawing trees. And they count their trees as they fall. And they saw from sunup to sundown. And they work till their fingers are to the bone and they've got, they've got calluses and they're tired as they can be. However, the ones who work the hardest, they look around and they notice that there's one guy that about every hour, he stops working. And they're all working hard. Bless God, I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to plow right on through and keep cutting my trees down. I'm not going to miss a moment. I'm not going to spare a, spare a minute of the day. But at the end of the day, they find out this guy who's been taking all these breaks, he's got twice as many trees that he's felled. Felled is a good word. It's a right word. He's felled twice as many trees. He's cut down twice as many trees as the guys who worked all day. They, they, they walk up and say, hey, man, what were you doing on all those breaks? He said, you guys know what? When you thought I was taking breaks, I was finding a nice little quiet place where I could go sharpen my saw. Sharpening my saw put me way ahead of you guys. Even though I stopped working, I was sharpening my saw. So that when I got back to work, I had a saw that was twice as sharp as yours. And you thought just by extra effort you could muscle through and cut down as many trees as me. But no, 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 no. you got to stop once in a while, get out of the routine, take a break. Can I tell you that really is the secret of Sabbath, honestly? I'm not even here to talk about Sabbath, but the Lord Jesus Christ knows that rest is where we get our where we get our true insight. When we stop, we pause, and we say, "This is a time we've got to give to the Lord." That's when we sharpen the saw. That that it is that happens to be the title of that chapter in the book, "Sharpen the Saw." One of those habits is to sharpen the saw. So here's what I'm doing tonight. When it comes to the preaching and the teaching of the Word, for for years now, I've wanted to do exactly what I'm doing right now. I wanted to stop and sharpen the saw on how you hear. So that this coming Sunday, when I preach or the Lord brings the word, most likely it's going to be yours truly preaching, that you come a little more sharpened because you know, number one, what was the first point we made? Focus on the message, not the messenger. Because sometimes the messenger is sick. Sometimes the messenger has a bad voice. Sometimes the messenger is in a bad mood. And sometimes the messengers heard really bad news before the service started. Focus on the message. <laughs> Don't stone the prophet. Don't kill the messenger. Listen to the message. Number two, come in on Sunday ready to listen for insight and throw entertainment out. Entertainment may be there, but it's not about entertainment. Number three, here we go. Y'all ready? Make it. When you listen and you encounter the word, you flip your Bible open in the morning, you listen to a good song of devotion, and you listen, you're thinking on the Lord, the things of the Lord, or even coming to church. Make it an act of worship more than just education. Education. 2 Timothy 3 16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. Hallelujah. It's profitable. Okay, pop quiz. Everybody's attention real quick. Profitable. What single element, four-letter word, have I already mentioned tonight that is key to being profit and having profit or to be productive? What is the, thank you, brother, say it loud, the seed. Wow. See how it connects to this? 2 Timothy 3.16. If you're sitting here and you're listening and you're thinking, whoa, pastor just said seed mix is productive, and that's where productivity comes from is seed being planted in the soil that's good. And look what it says. So all Scripture is given for you to have fruit. All Scripture is given 
by inspiration of God. And I love what the English version, English standard says. All Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is breathed out by God. You want to get God's breath? Start inhaling some Scripture. Take some deep breaths and you'll inhale the breath of God. All scripture is inspired. You know the word inspire comes from the same root word as respire, respiration, right? Or expire, when you stop breathing. <laughs> expire. To be inspired is to mean we got some CPR from God. Hallelujah. How many of you ever needed some CPR from God before? Okay, let's just back up. How many of you ever needed CPR like the real thing, like CPR physically? Anybody ever needed CPR before? Man, that's scary. I would hate to need CPR. Don't if I need CPR, just go right ahead and put your lips right up against mine. My wife won't mind. It's okay. Just blow hard and get me some breath. Okay? All right? She'll be happy. But it is kind of gross, isn't it? Pinch the nose, tilt the head back a little, and blow. That's called CPR. What does CPR stand for? pulmonary resuscitation same thing as revival I think every one of us once in a while we've got to have a little spiritual CPR and I say Lord breathe right on into me and you know what if, if you ever you ever end up in a in a culture or society that doesn't believe in having church above ground go ahead and go underground but don't stop reading your Bible every single day well, I read. I told y'all on Sunday there are put, there are places in our world today that would rather have a Bible than to have that same weight in gold in their hand because a Bible is so meaningful to them. So many of us just take it so easily for granted, but it's the Word that is the breath of God breathing into our, our into our bodies. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable. It's productive, and it will produce doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, perfect, have all the furnishings of good works at his disposal. Amen. Anybody love the word? Wow. You know what? I would say mission accomplished tonight if I made you fall a little more in love with the word of God. Whether it's preached or whether it's read or it's heard in a melody. Thank God for scripture. All right. So as you listen to a message like this one right now. You ask yourself, I'm not, I'm, not looking, I'm not looking for education. I'm looking for how this can become a connection with God in worship. I want to worship God through this moment of sitting and listening. Can, can you imagine you're actually worshiping right now, sitting there? You know, worship is not making noise. Worship can happen, and a lot of the most important worship doesn't make noise. It's you and God in a one-on-one -on -one connection. And so here's what I want to ask you. As you're listening, is God revealing something to you about his character, about his heart, about his will? Is he opening your eyes to something you didn't see before? What is he making you to know that you didn't know before about who he is? The more we know of the one true God, the greater depth and passion that our true worship will have. And I want to be a true worshiper who worships in spirit and in truth. All right? We've been through three things. Number four, engage the moment spiritually rather than remaining detached. Engage the moment spiritually rather than remaining detached. So important. Engage. All right, what's the opposite of engage? Disengage. You know, your car, any car, would get nowhere if the gears didn't engage with the engine. And then if the gears didn't engage with the drivetrain, engagement is required for there to be movement in a vehicle. Engagement, when those gears come together. Have you ever ridden a bike before and your, and your chain comes off and you're just pedaling your heart out but going nowhere and the chain's dragging the ground or broken? That's disengaged. Disengaged. You know, it kind of feels the same way, Brother Jake, when the preaching's going on and everybody's like, man, well, when are we going to leave? Man, this is just getting so tiring. What is the pastor trying to help us with? But if you would just say, okay, come on, come on. You've got to kind of shake yourself once in a while. Go ahead and shake yourself. Get a little heebie-jeebies. Come on, let me go. I want to engage in this tonight. 
want to engage. I've, have you ever been falling asleep at the wheel and almost crash your car? Have you ever been there before? You know the key to that is to suddenly shake yourself. And I found out if you tense up every muscle you can think of and you hold it for three or four minutes, you'll wake right back up. Maybe someone, now I'm going to be looking out at the audience. Everybody's going, <laughs> like, what are you doing? I'm engaging. <laughs> Stay engaged. Stay connected. Let those gears connect. Let the chain stay on the sprocket. When you engage, you know what's happening? Awesome things truly can happen. I've got a passage for you. Ephesians 1.16. Let's not be dis- detached, amen? How about we make a decision we're going to stay engaged spiritually in each moment of, of, of inter- encounter with God's word. The scriptures, this is the apostle saying, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here's what I pray. This is my prayer for you. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened and ye may, that ye may know what is the hope. Oh, God, don't let us go through life without knowing what the hope of his calling is and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, ooh, hallelujah, but also in that which is to come. Folks, we are encountering right now a little intersection between the world that is to come and the world that is. Hallelujah. Anybody heard any preaching on that lately? Anybody heard anything about that? The world that is to come? The not yet? Aren't you thankful tonight? I am, I'm a grateful man right now that I know the name of Jesus Christ. And his name is above every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world that is to come. There is no greater name. And not only do I know that name, but I pray in that name. And not only do I pray in that name, but I've been baptized in that name. And not only have I been baptized, well, I want to try to get some other people to wake up to the fact that they need to be baptized in that glorious name. Praise God. How about it? Let's engage. The, the, the apostle is saying to the church in Ephesus, I, I want you you guys should be so engaged that, that when, when you're hearing the word of the Lord, it's, it's coming across as enlightenment and inspiration, and you're being transformed as you're staying engaged. Now, just, just to be telling you the, the full truth, no one, not even me, none of us walk into church completely carefree. We're all distracted by burdens. We're all distracted by problems we face, curveballs that life throws our way, didn't know they were even going to happen this past Sunday, but here we are Tuesday night, curveballs, life threw our way. But can I tell you something? The more you insist on being engaged, the more you're going to receive God's guidance. And that what that means is you listen to the words that are being spoken, and you let, your, let the sprocket and the chain connect, because worry, stress, problems... They're going to do their best to take the chain off your sprocket. They're going to do their best to disengage and distract and detach you and make you so you're just kind of like spinning your wheels. You're in neutral, going nowhere. And you know what, what's happening is you're basically not even receiving anything from God and not even listening to what God is saying. So I'm going to give you just a quick little hint that I've learned. A great way to resist being detached, listen to this. Here's a great way to get fully engaged in the moment. Is not only seek what God is saying to you personally, but be aware of what's happening in the room and pray for others. That's good. Everybody say, it's good. (laughs) Amen. Think about the crowd. Think about the people around you. Think about how they're responding or not. Think about what's happening in the greater good of the church and start praying for the church. You can start praying under your breath at any moment saying, God, let my pastor have strength. Let his words really make a, make a mark and make an impact on this congregation and help us as we move forward, Lord. And pray for my neighbors, God. I pray for my, my, those sitting on the same bench as me. And I pray for those who are across the way. I pray for everybody in this sanctuary. I want to make sure that all of us together are sensing that we need God in this moment. And we all all need to pay attention to what's happening in the spirit realm and, a- and engage God in his work. And I'm going to tell you something. That right there is what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were all 
with one accord in one place. They were all in the same gear. They all had the chain on the sprocket, and they were all watching God pull them and make a change in the history of the world. They were all engaged. They were all connected together. The Holy Ghost may put someone on your mind at a moment like right now. You know what? When the Holy Ghost lays someone on your mind, you stop right there. You just bow your head and start praying for them right then. And say, God, touch them. Be with them. You know what's going on in their life. That's what, is, that's what this kind of teaching is all about, is to help us with this. I'm almost finished, brothers. Almost finished, sisters. Last one, number five, pursue personal change over perfect content. That has got to happen. That has got to happen. No one loves and enjoys polished sermons more than I do. I love perfect content. And I'm tempted to try to get perfect content out when I preach. But you know what? That can rob us. It can rob us. Because there's going to be some times when God just says, hey, he ain't going to do that no more. Pat, Pat, he tells me, he said, Don, the second you're not preaching that anymore. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to preach? This past Sunday night, I had no idea I was going to preach about faith in the storm and vision and venture and victory. I had no idea I was going to preach that. I responded on the moment right then. That's why it wasn't so awesomely packaged, if any of you noticed. <laughs> I just preached and I got, got it off my heart because the Lord laid it on there. So what is it? What am I saying? I'm saying, pre folks, when it's your turn to do this, you're going to be really glad that I preach this. Because it's really hard for us to come up with perfect content. It's better and it's most, mo most important for us to pursue personal change. Hallelujah. You're going to like this, this next eight-word sermon because this, this really made them have some short church. They had a short church but long revival. Hey, everybody's like, high impact, low commitment? Really? Where, where do you read that? I have a five-word sermon, and I have an entire region, territory, shaking revival that happened. It's in the book of Jonah. Jonah 3, 4. Jonah wasn't polished. Jonah just was got vomit all over him still. He's still just like in the belly of the whale. He's still picking seaweed off. And he goes into town of Nineveh, and he starts to preach. But you know what? He doesn't preach a long message. The Bible says that he entered into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, read the words, just count them, all right? Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Let's all stand and have an altar call. That's it right there. Would you all be like, what? Hold on just a minute. I, that was eight words. But the content was more important. It was more important to understand the change than the content. The change was more important. Do you see hear what I just it does it say it on the screen? Pursue personal change over perfect content. All right? Here's what verse number five says. This is what happened. Jonah preached the shortest message in the Bible. Yet forty days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words. Verse five. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. I want you to watch this. Check out the personal change that's happening. Has nothing to do with a perfect message. Has nothing to do with coming from a slick, polished, entertaining platform. No, Jonah just preached. But there was a hunger in the heart of Nineveh. Somehow the people of Nineveh believed God and the king himself. He arose from his throne. He laid his robe from him and covered himself with sackcloth and, sackcloth and sat in ashes. And then jumping to verse number 9, the king said, who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not? And look at the revival. The Bible says in verse number 10, God saw their works. And I believe their works were model works for every one of us. Hear the word. Don't depend on it being long. Depend on it being anointed, inspired, correction-oriented guidance oriented and then change quickly God saw their works and then not only did the people repent but God repented you see that he repented of the evil that means he changed his mind 
they changed their mind that they were going to stop serving evil gods and they were going to stop being the people who were neglecting God. And they started listening. They listened to that message by Jonah and God himself repented of the evil. And he said, the things that I said I was going to do to you, case dismissed, you're acquitted. I'm not going to do any of those things. What relief must have come to the heart of those people? And it was all because they caught that last thing I said. They pursued personal change over the content, perfection of a sermon. Praise God. All right? So how are we doing? Did we sharpen the saw a little bit? Five things. Five things. When we hear the word, when we're engaged in the word, we read the word, the purpose of it, folks, is growing spiritually and growing fruit. Praise God. I'm so thankful for the word of the Lord. If you have your Bible, I would like for you just to, just to hold it close as you stand with me right now. Get, get your Bible. And I know some of you just may have a virtual Bible in your, in your smart device, and that's, that's okay. But I, I want us to hold our Bible and, and just want to encourage you to be Bible reading. I, you know, I, the Lord's been convicting me about just reading my, all my Bible on, on a smart device, tablet or phone or whatever. Because if you read the Bible in pages, like this right here I'm holding, this thing does not vibrate and tell me I've got a text. This, this thing doesn't remind me of, a, of an uh, event coming up. It doesn't alarm me that I'm late for a meeting. No, this right here does even more than that. <laughs> this wonderful word of God from cover to cover. I, I really want to devote myself like never before in the future. I want to devote myself starting now to the word of the Lord being something I study carefully. Spiritual word, spiritual growth. There might be days when all you need is comfort. Here's what your, here's what your end game needs to be right here. Sometimes you need wisdom, and sometimes we just need to sense that God is close by. Folks, can I tell you, his word is where we get it. Ultimately, the purpose of God's word is spiritual maturity and faith. Content doesn't need to be perfect, doesn't need to be polished for change to take place. Listen to this. These are words that I think are meaningful. The power to change is up to God, but the choice to change is up to you. Aren't you thankful the power of God to change never changes? The power of change, the power to change you is, in, is totally up to God and his, his knowledge and his wisdom. But even though that power is there, it will do nothing unless you make the choice to let God change you as you get his word saturating into your spirit in Jesus name as your pastor God helps me work hard to be prepared absolutely but in the end folks God himself delivers what we need it's not me it's not a man when we choose then to respond then God gets the glory and we have the advancement and we can bear fruit that's the goal that we've all got to have is to be a church that is growing not numerically only but growing in our depth of love for the Lord therefore we can and only then can we grow others in our lives in Jesus name hold your Bible close by would you join me in a prayer right now for the Lord to let our commitment to him be grown and let the sword certainly be sharpened in our in our hand tonight and let's pray the Lord to let these words help us to do a little better when it comes to capturing the word of the Lord Jesus thank you for the encounter with your word Lord thank you for the truth oh Lord you said we would know the truth and the truth would set us free Lord we don't want to hold this truth in unrighteousness God Lord, we want to hold the truth, Jesus, in a way that is, a, that is a conduit, ready and able, Lord, and willing to transfer it to those who are willing to listen in our vicinity. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I pray that tomorrow, Wednesday, and right on through the weekend, that you give, them, give us opportunities, Lord, for us to be able to testify, to be able to witness, and to speak clearly, Lord, to those around us of your word. Because